We have had some amazing uh, speakers, some very enlightening topics. I love how Mountain West always seems to kind of hit all over the place. You get uh, systems uh, programming, you get uh, web programming, you talk about people's pet projects. This afternoon we're going to hear about some, some cool uh, stuff uh, to do with you know, different kinds of systems. So uh, it's, it's really awesome to be here. I just want to say, just want to start off by saying that. Uh, today I'm going to talk about parsing expressions and specifically using them in the Ruby uh, programming language. Uh, by raising hands, can I just see really quickly how many people are familiar with the idea of parsing expressions uh, or heard about it or used them before? How many people have used maybe a, a library like Treetop? Okay, excellent. Okay, so we're, we're speaking to a pretty good audience here. I just want to talk a little bit about myself. I love Ruby. I've been using Ruby for about uh, three years now. Um, professionally, I work for PATH in San Francisco. Path.com, we're a, a small startup working on a, an iPhone app and a social network, and I handle all of our, our website and our APIs and everything like that. Um, so, I know something about you, and uh, I know that you have a dirty little secret. I know that most people in this room have a very dirty little secret that's hiding out somewhere deep in the bowels of their app. And uh, it looks something like this. <laughs> How many people have one of these lurking deep in the bowels of their app? Okay, and how many of you were like, were like, man, okay. Uh, so first of all, what does this do? <laughs> Any ideas what this does here? It parses a URL. Man, we got some geniuses in here. How did you figure that out? Parsing a URL. It's all of these kind of dub, 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 right? Okay. All right. We know now what this does. Uh, this particular example came from daringfireball.net. Uh, John Gruber wrote this one. It's supposed to be a uh, Perl compatible. I worked on an app one time that had something to look like this. And I was like, what? So it started with an HTTP optional S or F, so apparently we're, we're, we're supporting FTP as well with this regular expression. Um, and when I saw this thing, I was like, yeah, man, I guess, whatever. <laughs> Hopefully whoever did that knew what they were doing because I sure as heck don't know what that's doing right there. So, um, so then, you know, we're kind of cruising along, we're developing our app, you know, and then one day we kind of hit a bug and I was like, What's, what's the problem here? It's having problems validating the URL. Um, and the URL looked something like this, right? It was somebody's blogspot URL that had a long subdomain. So, any guesses on, on what the performance is of this regular expression on this URL? Any, any guesses on like how long it actually takes to validate this URL? 12 seconds. 12 seconds? 97 seconds. <laughs> I was like, man, why is this failing? Right? Because we've got our unicorn processes that are just being like slaughtered after a minute, right? Because if they run for a minute, the, the, the master is like, what the heck are you doing, man? Something, something is terribly wrong. Die, right? And so every time somebody tried to save a user account with a blog spot address like, you know, jimmyandjane.blogspot.com, uh, they were getting a 500 because the server just like died. You know? and I was like, man, what is going on? It's this beast that's hiding out deep in my app. And I have no idea what the heck this thing is doing. So, beware if you're using something like this because I know that most of the time the, uh, the tendency is to kind of go out and, and say like, hmm, I need to validate a URL. I need to validate an email address. Solve problem, right? People on the internet have done that before. Google will help me out. Validate URL Ruby. Ah, there it is. Copy paste in my app. Go out to lunch, right? You're done. For, you're done for the day. So let's let's take a step back and let's talk a little bit about what is the problem that we're trying to solve with these regular expressions, right? What what is the core of the problem? It is text. We've got text from all sorts of different sources. We've got text coming in from our users when they're filling out forms on our website. We've got text that's coming in from web services, whether it's 
I'm pinging uh, some, some API for XML or JSON, or I'm reading a config file that's got YAML in it. I've got text that's coming back from you know, a service like Redis that's just sitting on a socket and it's sending me back binary data. I've got to like parse that. I've got all these sorts of different uh, texts come out coming back. And for some, I have really good parsers, right? For XML, for JSON, for YAML, these standard formats, I have awesome parsers, right? I can just whoop out my notebook Geary, I can whoop out my YAML <coughs> gem or whatever, and I can get the job done. Um, but unfortunately, what the problem is, we, for all the other cases, we kind of don't really know what to do. It's like, well, how do I, I guess I got, I'll just use a regex, right? I'll just use my regular expression. That'll parse that stuff. Then, because uh, I don't really have a good parser for it, so I'll just use this. And it's, it's, it really has become a hammer for most of us, because we kind of, we just see like a nail there, you know, and it doesn't matter if the nail is made of glass or steel or whatever, you just whack it, you know, and hope that, that, your, that your tool works. Um, but there, the thing is, regular expressions really weren't designed to do a lot of the jobs that we're doing with them. So let's talk about what, what do we need then? What are the alternatives, right? Because I'm guessing that most of us just use regular expressions all the time because, and I'm, I'm not saying that never use them, right? They're obviously really good for some things. Obviously, yeah, they're, they're, they're a very powerful tool. But for, uh, for other certain types of text, we need something that's more powerful. For example, uh, if I'm going to, uh, for example, who is who's, who's read the spec, the, the RFC 3986, that talks about actually how to build the URI. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty lengthy, like the, the, the grammar for, act, uh, for validating a URI is actually pretty lengthy. And so what happens when somebody tries to build a regular expression, to parse that, they open up the spec, they're like, oh man, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Uh, here, this regular expression works for the majority of the cases, and then they move on. But what we really would like is a tool that, that enables us to take a spec like that, something that we find in an RFC, something that's written in an ABNF style syntax, and to turn it into code, right? So there's no guesswork on the way from the RFC to the code. So my parser isn't like a good idea, it's actually something that was spec'd out beforehand, right? So, uh, so let's talk about a couple of qualities that we would like when we're actually building our parsers. Obviously, we want it to be fast. We don't have time to just parse stuff, right? Like, that's, that's the beginning of what we need to do. We just want to parse it and get on with whatever, uh, whatever we want to do with that data. We want it to be simple, right? We want it to be simple because um, if I cannot read it, I cannot maintain that thing. And I have... I have very little understanding of the code that is in my app. Um, so maybe some of you can understand 1,200 character regular expressions, but I don't, I don't get it very well. It doesn't compute. Here's a, here's a fun one. I want it to be modular, right? Lots of times I'm reading a spec, and I'm like reading the, the URI spec, for example, and it says um, a host, for example, could be either a host name, a canonical host name, like www.facebook.com, or it could actually be an IP address. Well, what is an IP address? An IP address is an entirely different spec, right? So ideally, what I'd like to do is, I'm thinking about this in Rubyland. Ideally, I'm thinking about the IP address module, and I'm thinking about the, the URI module, and I just want to include the IP address module into my URI module, right? I want them to be sort of separate things so that I can use them for different cases and then combine them as needed. Also, I want this thing to be flexible, right? I don't want it to be, to be very rigid. In other words, when I, when I execute uh, a, a, an expression, when I, when I pattern match on a string um, and I get back an A, if I'm parsing sentences in the English language, I know that that A actually uh, should be interpreted literally. But if I'm parsing hexadecimal numbers, I know that that A actually isn't a letter at all. It actually represents a number, right? So in that, in that context, I want to be able to change context based on what it is I'm parsing. Okay, so 
these are some high and mighty requirements for, uh, for a parser. So let's talk about this again. Is it fast? Depends. <laughs> Right? If you don't, in this case, if you don't have a super long subdomain, yeah, it's pretty fast. It'll run pretty fast. A couple milliseconds, you'll be fine. Um, is it uh, modular? Can I take this and like include it into something else, or can I can I reuse any of this, or is it just sort of dead? Um, can is it uh, is it flexible? Do I do I have any control over? how the tokens that this parses are actually going to be interpreted without writing a whole bunch of other code that's going to go after and say, okay, if match zero equals this, then, uh, then this, otherwise this, right? I have to do a lot of work at the end uh, to, actually, to actually use this thing. So let's talk about an alternative, parsing expressions. Um, we're actually first discussed at MIT by a man named Brian Ford in 2004. They are a declarative alternative to uh, a generative uh, style like, like regular expressions uh, and, and other CFGs in, in general. Uh, you can find out more about them here at these two URLs. Um, and don't worry, I'm, I'm posting all these slides and everything uh, after I'm done today. Let's kind of do a quick comparison, parsing expressions versus regular expressions. Uh, parsing expressions are declarative, regular expressions are generative. I'm not going to go too much into detail there, uh, but the, the difference is actually pretty important. Parsing expressions are able to be recursive, regular expressions are not able to be recursive, which is actually one of the key reasons why parsing expressions are pretty good at parsing computer formats, because a lot of computer formats are <coughs> highly recursive. You have structures nested within other structures. Uh, parsing expressions are pretty readable, regular expressions not so much. Parsing expressions are pretty easy to maintain, regular expressions are rather difficult to maintain once they grow past a certain size, right? Uh, this next uh, comparison refers to how they go about uh, parsing your data. So, uh, parsing, a parsing expression is not ambiguous. In other words, as you're reading the tokens in a stream, if you see a certain token, you make a decision to go from that token in a certain direction. Whereas a regular expression might see that token and then depending on the next, what the next token is or what the hundredth token is from there, it may have to backtrack and take a different, take a different approach, take a different route. Uh, parsing expressions are actually pretty fast. Regular expressions for most cases in small text are faster, right? So I was looking into this idea, I was like, yeah, I really want to use parsing expressions, I want to get into them, and I went to the treetop library. Um, for a couple of reasons that I really won't go into detail here, uh, I just didn't like Treetop. It, to me, it, it seemed very slow. Uh, it wasn't being actively maintained, um, and uh, it, 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 it was very difficult to deal with the, the results that I got back. So, and there was a t there was just way too much code there. I was like, this has to be. I mean, it, we're just parsing text. Like, this should be done in maybe a thousand lines of code. Uh, so. Uh, so what I actually did is I wrote a library called um, Citrus. So uh, Citrus, you can actually get, you can download it from, uh, from this URL, you just gem install Citrus, uh, or you can go to uh, this URL on your mjitaxi.com slash citrus to find out more about it. So let me go back to one slide I skipped over, it was this slide. This is um, the way that Citrus specifies its uh, parsing, its, its expression, right? So you've got a grammar in this case, it's called addition. So it looks very much like Ruby code, but don't be fooled, it's not actually Ruby code. It just looks like Ruby code to make you feel comfortable, right? So you've got uh, two rules in this grammar. One is called addition, one is called number. Now, the key ability of a rule is to refer to another, to be able to refer to another rule, rule by its name. So in this case, addition can refer to number uh, by just saying number. So uh, a lot of the syntax is actually very similar to what you'll find in regular expressions to kind of make it familiar to you. So, in this case, a number is uh, any of the characters 0 through 9. I, I've got a little character class there. An, ad an addition, we're going to say, is a number followed by uh, one or more pluses and then a number. Right? It's pretty simple. So, this is what I want my grammars to look like, and I'm going to go into some more advanced examples of how we can actually take RFCs and we can put them into grammars like this and just build parsers from them automatically. 
So it's interesting. So let's, let's go briefly through the syntax. This is going to be kind of a whirlwind. Most of it should be pretty familiar to you. So um, like I said, it, it looks like Ruby code, but it's not actually Ruby. We need to know how Citrus is actually going to parse these, these files when we write stuff in them. So we can use double quoted strings to match a string of characters, or likewise single quoted strings. We can use uh, a special kind of string like that called a case insensitive string. Just put it in, in back ticks, and that will match either the lowercase hello world or any variation of that case. Um, that's actually pretty useful for, for uh, lots of different RFCs. We'll say something like, uh, you know, the case is not important here, the case is not significant. Um, you can actually put, uh, you know, escaped characters. In other words, these, these double-coded strings are interpreted exactly like Ruby strings, right? So I can put a hex character in there. Uh, I can put them in, in these case-insensitive strings as well. I can actually stick a regular expression inside, kind of as a last resort. If there's something that I just, occasionally I just really need to use a regular expression because I know how to do this already because I'm familiar with regular expressions, right? So Citrus is not like a purist's approach, it's more of a hybrid approach, right? If I've got a little bit of text that I just really want to match quickly with a regular expression, I can drop down to a regular expression primitive and, and get the job done. Uh, and, you know, they, they work with all the flags and everything. Uh, character classes are, are what you would expect. Um, this, in this case, we would match a, a hexadecimal character. Uh, same thing, but with... Uh, with you know hex characters, so they're exactly like you would expect. They're interpreted just like Ruby. Um, a dot matching a character and a single character. Um, so uh, we're, now when we get into repetition, uh, the star means zero or more. Uh, now you can put a number on either side of the star. The number on the right means maximum number of times this may match. The number on the left means minimum number of times this must match. Right. So uh, those two cases, uh, star one and one star, uh, you're probably used to seeing as, as question mark and plus, which uh, Citrus also supports. So, um, so you can specify repetition in this way. Um, so this, in this example, we would match the string hello world zero or more times. Pretty, pretty elementary stuff. In this uh, scenario, we would match the string hello world a minimum of two, a maximum of three times. Uh, no, so now, so this is a sequence. So if I want to say you must match something <coughs> immediately followed by something else, I just separate them by some white space, right? So I can say match the string hello, white space, then match the string world. Um, if I also have ordered choice, right? So I can say match ABC or match DEF. This is, this is ordered now, so remember, once I match ABC, I'm not going to go back later and try and match DEF. I'm matching ABC and I'm continuing from there. Uh, and that way the, the parse tree is, is not ambiguous. For any valid parse, there's only a single route through your grammar, uh, which actually helps, uh, helps it to be quite fast. Um, in this example, I can use parentheses to, to sort of uh, you know, group things together. So I could say A or B one or more times, right? Pretty, pretty simple stuff. Um, I also have a positive and negative look ahead. So this will say, match a string hello followed by a string world, but don't consume the world portion of the string, right? Just consume the hello portion of the string. Um, this, uh, this would be like a, a, a negative look ahead, right? So I would, I would say match any character that is, that is not preceded by A, B, C, right? So as the parser is going through the string, it, it, it considers this character and then it says, is there an A, B, C here in the input? If so, uh, I'm not going to match it. Otherwise, I'm going to match it and consume that character. Uh, this is a common idiom. For example, this would match any character that is not uh, one, or more, one or more characters that are not A, B, C. You know what I'm saying? So if you want to say, match all characters up until you see this sequence of characters, match anything up until you see A, B, C in the input string, you use something like this. This is just a common, common key. Um, and since it's so common, you can actually, I reduced it down, you can actually just use the tilde operator, which is kind of common in some parsing expression implementations. You can just use the tilde to say, match anything, one or more characters up until you see A, B, C. So let's talk about what, I'm talk, what I mean when I say a match, okay? Matches are built into trees, okay? Um, a, a match is essentially a node in this tree, 
and it may have any number of sub-matches, right? These are all lazily instantiated so that the thing is pretty fast, right? So all I have to do is say, uh, try and match on this string, I'll build one node, and it knows how to build all of its child nodes so that when I query it and I want to extract information from it and actually interpret what that node means in the context of my application, uh, it can dynamically build that information out, right? So the initial parse, parse is, is pretty fast. Uh, so let's, let's take like this example. This is kind of visual how, how, how these matches are organized into trees. So I, I start with the string one space plus two. Um, and it, it might be uh, broken down, depending on how my grammar is organized, into this uh, subtree. I might, uh, you know, have, have a, a one space, which is further broken down into a one and a space, or I might have, you know, this two over here uh, that's matched by some other rule. So the, the cool thing about these matches, about these nodes, is that since I'm in, I'm in Ruby, and these are just Ruby objects, I can actually extend these objects with any Ruby module that I want, right? So I can say, uh, here I've got a node, and I want to, uh, I want to extend it with some methods, right, that are going to help me extract information from that node, right? They're going to help me interpret it. So Citrus is not only to do with the, with the parsing of text, but it also goes a step beyond and allows me to define these modules. I call them semantic blocks. It's just a block of code that's going to get extended onto your node in your match tree so you can actually call methods on that node and it becomes much more useful to you instead of just being a, a little string of text. So enough talking, let's get into some code. Uh, this is a classical example of something you, you just can't do with regular expressions. Uh, this is a grammar called uh, paren char. And my first rule here is, is paren char. And uh, basically I'm just trying to match an open parenthesis followed by something else, followed by a closed parenthesis, right? So this something else um, has actually got a, a label on it, so I'm going to call it letter. And uh, what am I calling letter? It is, a print, it is another parent char or a char. A char in this case is just any letter A through Z. So you can see this is, this is, this is actually going to recurse to find, for example, an, a, a letter, a single letter, that is nested in any number of even uh, parentheses, right? Uh, this is a, a classic example of something that regular expressions just, just can't do because they're not, they're not able to be recursive. Um, so I'm going to take that, that expression there, I'm going to surround it with some parentheses and group it, and I'm going to apply this semantic block to that entire, uh, and that entire expression, right? So I'm going to say the value of this block is letter.value. Uh, what is letter? Letter is a paren char or a char. Uh, in the case of paren char, it's just going, it's going to recurse and call this block again on that paren char. In the case of char, it's just going to give me the letter. Uh, so this dot value method is defined any time you attack a semantic block onto something. The default value for something is just its string value, right? A node uh, is just a piece of the original input string, and so its default value is just its, its raw string value. Um, so let me... Uh, let me actually just go through one more example, and then we're going to do some live code, which everybody's advised me not to do, but I think it's more fun when I actually do it. So I'm looking forward to it. Yes. Yes. How many people are looking forward to live code? <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Now, now watch. Epic fail. Okay. So, I've got this. Uh, this is another one that we already saw, right? An addition is going to be like one or a number followed by one or more pluses and then another number. Um, in this case, I don't, I don't want that text, I don't want that number to be, I don't want to get back a string of text, right, because it's a number. So what I want to say is, when I get that string of text, call 2i on it, and that's the value of a number, right? So now that I'm getting, actu I'm actually getting a, a digit, right, an, an integer back from mm -hmm. my number rule, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tack on a semantic block to the addition rule. Um, just in case you have trouble following that, 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 transition there. This is actually the code that I tacked on, right? So I enclosed the whole thing in parentheses, and then I said, this is the value of an addition, right? It is, essentially, all of your numbers, right? So this captures method kind of goes, goes deep and finds all, all of the times that number matched. And it basically just says, uh, add them all up, right? In other words, inject them into this zero, 
and, uh, and add, them, add, add the n dot value every time you, you come across an n, which would be a, a number node, right? So let's kind of, let's, uh, whoops, not yet. Let's pop into the terminal and see some of this stuff in action. So, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop into, so let me show you here. I've got, um, I've got some, some, uh, So I've got some uh, some Citrus files here. Uh, these addition and parenchar Citrus files are exactly the same ones that we just went through. So let me fire up IRB. Uh, where am I? Oh. Okay. Okay. So I've got Citrus here. So I'm running on, on Citrus head, which actually I just come. Just committed like 10 minutes before walking into this room, so it's nice and fresh. Uh, so let's let's say I want to load up that addition grammar, right? I want to say citrus.load addition. Right? And then in this case, it's just going to look in the same directory and it's going to load up my addition grammar. Uh, it's going to return all grammars that it finds in that file in an array. Now grammars are actually in Ruby land, they're just Ruby modules. So I can take a grammar and I can include it in another module, uh, whatever. So let's say uh, my match is going to be an addition dot parse. Now we said it was a number followed by one or more pluses and then numbers, right? So I'm like, great, that matched. Uh, what is the value of that match? Should be four, right? Four in the integer, not four in the string of text, right? Um, let's say, uh, let's load that other, that other grammar, uh, our parent char grammar. And let's just say, uh, match oh, is paren char parse. Uh, and I'm going to say uh, A, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a mistake, right? This thing shouldn't match, right? So let's check it out. This is one of the nice things about Citrus that I just couldn't find anywhere else. Uh, intuitive, readable error messages, because as programmers, we are not perfect, and we mess up stuff all the time, especially when playing with new technology. So we need a good readable error message. So, uh, so check it out here. I've got, oh, you failed to parse the input on line one at offset two of the input. So zero based offset, so that tells me, oh, okay, so that, that input was invalid, right? So let's, let's see if I want to uh, actually parse uh, some valid input. Okay, so then I can say, uh, now the value of the match is just supposed to be its, uh, its letter dot value, and I get back the letter A, right? So these are, these are pretty elementary uh, examples of, of, of these kinds of things. So let's get out of here. Oops. Okay, so Citrus actually ships with uh, some pretty cool examples in the examples directory. Um, so, uh, so here it is uh, in the examples directory. I've got, I've got a couple of, of examples, all the Citrus files with their accompanying unit tests. So if you're like wondering, like, how, how would I actually use this thing? It's got an accompanying file, underscore test.rb, that shows you how you would actually use this from the Ruby code. Right, so, uh, so I've got a couple of them. For example, I've got like this, uh, this calc example is, is actually really cool. Uh, put that a little less. Oh. Just like I told you, I would fail, right? Okay, so grammar, so I've got my, my calc grammar. Now this grammar is actually pretty cool if you're just getting into this stuff and you're learning it for the first time. This is a grammar that is designed to interpret mathematical expressions exactly as Ruby's interpreter would, would do, right? So I can use any of Ruby's uh, numbers or floats or numbers with like underscores in them or any of that weirdness that Ruby does. And I can use any of the operators. They'll all be, uh, white space will be appropriately ignored. And expressions will, uh, operator precedence will work uh, as, as it should, right? Uh, and this has, again, this has a whole suite of tests that, that, uh, that go along with it. So I invite you to, to, to try and break it if you can. Um, that would actually be really cool. Because it would get better. So, uh, so let's, let's fire up Citrus again. And I'll show you how that show you how that works. Okay, good. We're in. Now let's load up that that calc example. Um, Citrus also has a 
a require function uh, on it where, that you can use to actually search your load path, and so that's kind of cool because then you can you can like just use it like Ruby's normal require except to require citrus files. Yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. So I've got this calc module. Um, so, something that's cool about these actually that I haven't showed you yet is they're, they're actually pretty inspectable. So I can say uh, they're, 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 pretty, they're pretty good to use at runtime. So I can say uh, calc dot rules, um, and I can see. Actually, let me let me do this so that it's clearer. Okay, um, so I can actually see uh, in in the grammar calc. Here are the rules, and here's what their rule definitions look like. Right. So if I'm ever like, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, oh my gosh, that's so small. Why didn't somebody say something? Okay, uh, so if I, if I want to know, like, what does this rule look like? What is this rule even doing? I can inspect it right in my terminal, right? So, um, so I want to say uh, match equals calc. So let's, let's first get an expression. And I'll say an expression is going to be, I don't know, 1 plus 6, <coughs> group it, 6, uh, modulo 2, uh, times 8.5. Okay, so I can say uh, eval expression, and I get 1.0. Wow, that's freaky. How did I? Six months through. Ah, yes. I told you, I did fail. Let me say. Uh, No, no, that's what I gotta do. That's what I gotta do. Like 
set up below that. Because when I say the require at the top, it's like going, it's actually going to the thing of load path. So let's say load path dot and shift uh, files, yes, file dot expand path. Thank you very much.